nanohub.org. Online simulation and more for nanotechnology. Uh, good morning, everyone. This is uh, session number three of our recitation series. The intent is to reach faculty members and maybe help them adopt uh, NanoHub for educational purposes in semiconductor education. So um, I'm going to start out with a homepage of NanoHub. And uh, one of the slogans we have is that we're making data and simulation pervasive. We really want to make uh, capabilities that have been usually limited uh, to people that are in computational science and computational semiconductors, etc., to make them much more broadly available. So our overall agenda in that sense is to, to enable people to model and simulate, and that's sort of our library of tools and apps we have available. And then we have curated content for people that uh, are interested in learning and teaching. Uh, we enable people to develop software, to convert their own um, uh, tools into apps that can reach people, and then ultimately share those content items with the community. But today, I really want to focus on semiconductor education and workforce development. And we have a landing page here on NanoHub. If you click on it, uh, you go to a page that is really um, delivering an uh, edited um, section or sec uh, elements that are available on NanoHub. I'll be talking a lot, a lot today about this immersive learning through simulations. But let me just highlight real quick um, the uh, we have open courseware available, meaning there's full courses um, as an um, as a MOOC uh, that's available. So we have fundamentals transistors, uh, my device uh, fundamentals class. The grad version here is is on here. Um, fundamentals of current flow, quantum transport, um, short course from atoms to devices, um, including thermal transport, etc. So these things are here. We also have some free textbooks that go with some of these courses. Those are new textbooks. Uh, we're highlighting uh, also an overall list of electronics apps and materials apps. Uh, we are engaging with commercial vendors. We have MATLAB and ThermalCalc on NanoHub. Uh, Silvaco tools will be coming soon. We have partners that uh, uh, curate resources as, cent and, uh, as a center to NanoHub. And we have ongoing faculty engagement. So here, yeah, there's a recitation series that you're participating in. And uh, um, the previous uh, sessions uh, you can find here um, in, in the recitation series here. So here is the recitation series where you can find all the videos of the prior sessions as well. So overviews. So today, we're sort of repeating something here. Uh, on band structure models. So let me go back to this uh, um, workforce development page. And if you click on semiconductor device fundamentals, uh, you will get to what we call Abacus. Abacus is really an assembly of different tools uh, that really foster the uh, teaching and learning of uh, semiconductor fundamentals. So. It covers concepts like crystals, uh, band structure models, bulk semiconductors, PN junctions, bipolar junction transistors, MOS capacitors, and MOSFETs. And that roughly reflects the, the seven sessions we're also having on uh, in this recitation series. So today, uh, we're looking at uh, band structure models and band structure, and uh, the typical way uh, to teach that is uh, with a so, uh, chronic penny model, periodic potentials, and we have a tool that's available. Um, I actually prefer to, to use this tool that uh, I helped create a couple of years ago, where you can see the emergence of band structure, and I will show you that. And then if you want to have more sophisticated band structures, such as bulk semiconductors or band structure, nanowires, etc., you can use Band Structure Lab as well. So let me um, dive in, and we're going to look here at the Periodic Potential Lab, and that is sitting as one of the many tools inside of Abacus. So I'm going to launch this tool, and maybe the uh, one thing uh, you 
I can kind of always fail to demo. Uh, you can um, register freely up here. I'm logged in already, but if you click up here, uh, you, uh, you register and then you can uh, launch any of the NanoHub tools. So, so let me launch the tool here. So the the Abacus tool set uh, popped up after clicking on the launch button. And what it is, it's uh, an, it's an assembly of tools. It's a one-stop shop, so to speak, for you to teach semiconductor devices. Uh, I've shown you animations in the group page. And in the group page, we have uh, some homework assignments and project assignments, et cetera. And today, I want to focus on the Periodic Potential Lab. Um, and I would like to also show you uh, the emergence of band structure in a finite super lattice. So uh, of this tool, we really have two versions. Um, there is a, a new version that is much more interactive. If you click on this one, it pops up a new window and it invokes a, a tool we call Chronic Penny Lab. And I'll demo that in a second here. In fact, I, I already uh, launched one here. So what, what it comes up with originally, if you just launch this tool, there's a visualization of a periodic potential simulation. So you have uh, the typical unit cell here of a single barrier and a single well. And uh, just for visualization, this is repeated to uh, let students understand that this is sort of an infinite uh, repetition. And what you see here is um, the associated um, band that exists in uh, a structure like this. So here's the uh, ground state band. Here's the excite, uh, second uh, band. Here's the third band. The third band actually corresponds to energies above the barriers. And uh, here's the fourth one. So what's kind of neat uh, is that you can also visualize the associated wave functions that are in these bands. And uh, by by clicking on the min and the max, it will visualize the the different uh, bands. For example, if I look at the um, one of the conduction bands that are above these modulated barriers, um, you can let's look at the the purple one here. For example, you can see. Yeah. Let's look at the blue one. So you actually the 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 first uh, one that's above the barriers has uh, nodes or or large amplitudes above the barriers and a smaller one um, below the barrier uh, uh, above the well. I'm sorry. And um, if you want to see the wave function of um, uh, the bands uh, up uh, that are on the top of the band, you click on this max button, and then you see. Actually, that there is uh, two nodes, two lobes uh, above the well, and a single more narrow uh, well uh, um, band above the well. So this actually corresponds to the bonding and anti-bonding state of the the same symmetry. And um, so some some of you may teach that. Uh, what you probably are more likely uh, to show the students is here this reduced. Um, um, dispersion so you end up uh, with the the band like this and it's um, actually useful to com to expand this out like this into the multiple brion zones and then you can also compare that to um to the free electrons so so here you see the free electron uh, uh dispersion and here you see now the the lowest band, the second band, the third band, and the third zone, fourth zone, et cetera. So what you can do now is um, have your students uh, go into this uh, the settings, for example, and um, change uh, barrier heights and well widths and ask questions, what happens when we make barriers uh, thicker? Uh, how do the bands modulate, et cetera? You can also, something that that is much harder to do. Um, uh, look at different potentials. For example, more realistically, you might actually have a Coulombic type potential, and to obtain analytical or semi-analytical uh, solutions in that is is much harder. And you see how um, 
different the energy distributions of the states are. You can do uh, other things also like uh, more sinusoidal uh, distribution uh, like this. You can also so, uh, do a, a sawtooth-like dispersion. So you can explore different dispersions like this. So if I go back to the more standard one, uh, here is now the, uh, the again, the square one. If I were to uh, make these barriers thinner, what would I expect? I mean, if I make these barriers thinner, I will couple these wells more. And if I couple the wells more, then uh, this, uh, the splitting, well, the, the tunneling, so to speak, between these barriers uh, is going to be easier, so the effective masses should get lighter. So if I, uh, if I go in here into my settings, and if I keep W the same, the width of the whole unit cell the same, but if I make the um, make the um, the um, uh, value a the barrier height smaller, so if I make it say three, but I leave the width of the cell constant. If I now click on here, it'll go off and calculate uh, this result. It's connecting uh, back to a uh, NanoHub and uh, requesting the results. Uh, we're in the process of making this run a little faster. Uh, so while this is running, let me go and um, go into Abacus and start uh, something else that I wanted to show you. So I'm going to go into this um, tool here, uh, which deals with transmission and tunneling. and. Um, so what this tool does, it can calculate tunneling through, say, a double barrier structure, or a triple barrier structure, or also just one barrier. And those are things you can calculate analytically. Um, but what I'd like to show you is something I use in my class when I teach band structure. And I do a, a simple uh, transmission coefficient calculations for the grad students as well. So I'm going to select uh, two barriers. I'm going to hit simulate, and this one was run before, so it should pull it out of the cache. And what you see is a double uh, double barrier, so it's like a particle in a box, and it has a bound state and an excited state, and then correspondingly you have a perfect transmission at that resonance state. And I'm plotting the position here in green and purple of these peaks, right? So I can uh, look also at the wave function of this. So here's my ground state. It's a particle in a box. The next one should be a double lobe, and it's a double lobe like this. So kind of what you expect uh, to see. You can also kind of see that here. So here's a single lobe, and here's a double lobe wave function in a more pictorial sense in this double barrier structure. So let me go in and I now make three barriers. So I would have two wells, and what you then see emerge is a double barrier structure where you have a bonding and anti-bonding states between two particles uh, in a box. So you can think of this as a quantum box and this as a quantum box. And uh, for so you have uh, these uh, ground states now split in a bonding and anti-bonding state, and each corresponds to a peak in the transmission and to a plot the peak here. Again, I can look at the, the uh, two wave functions. So here now I have uh, the ground state is talking uh, across the two wells. The excited state, um, well, this is the second state, and that's the anti-bonding state. And if I put my cursor kind of here and I go back, you can actually see how the peak moves away from each, uh, from the center. So in one, the bonding state is getting closer. It's bonding the electron across the barrier. In the middle, you have the barrier here. And the anti-bonding state actually pushes the wave functions apart. The next state up should be, again, like a, a double state, but it's bonding with a double state in the neighbor. And here is the anti-bonding state doubling uh, across the neighbor. And how does that look like? Uh, in, in this pictorial diagram, so you have, you have a ground state, the antibonding state, here is the bonding state, and the antibonding state. So 
So this is like two hydrogen atoms next to each other, if you will. Uh, you can do this in solid state. And if you look at the band structure like this, you can compare, look, there's a single peak that goes to a double peak with two states. Now, the interesting thing you can do is, let me, let me go now and make this to be eight barriers. So I should have seven wells. And you can see how, you know, I have seven peaks here and how the band structure uh, the, uh, is getting, or the, uh, really flat here. You're starting to form a band. If I now go in and do double this again, say to 16, then you really see how the transmission is forming a true band where it's really blocking carriers to flow in the middle of this gap here. And you're starting to really form a gap and you see how these um, uh, basically, K points or the the dispersion of this band is emerging very naturally, and I've gotten questions from my students like, "How, if we're in nanoelectronics, how many atoms does it take to really establish band structure? If your finfet is only, say, 30, 40 atoms wide, um, so you can really explore that and see how band structure emerges. So, um, to me, since I it, since I do some quantum mechanics in my semiconductor grad course, um, I can have the students calculate the transmission through a double barrier. We can also have them calculate through a single barrier. And then I have them play like this where they see band structure emerge. So to me, this is a very, very powerful tool um, uh, for learning band structure uh, compared to this one here where um, you have to have the concept of a periodic cell and uh, and uh, this concept of a Bloch wave functions, etc. Et you can do some of these experiments that I, I highlighted in the other tool. You can do them here. So I, I earlier I made the barrier smaller, and uh, if I I get a dispersion, and if I look at this just the dispersion like this. I can also compare that to the previous result. And you can see that um, indeed uh, the curvatures here are getting uh, lighter, meaning there's more curvature. The effective mass is getting um, lighter because the coupling between the bands is um, uh, stronger as I made the barrier thinner. So here I can also do this comparison. This might be quite messy though, uh, if I compare it like this, yeah, because I also had this Coulombic thing there. So let me not do that. Um, let me go back to um, clear the history. Um, let me go in here. So here's. Um, uh, what I highlighted, uh, similar the emergence of band structure, um, and when I when I teach it, I had talked with my students as well. You can, well, you can interpret this as transmission, and that's how it's actually calculated. Um, but you can also think of this chunk of material here in blue as your new material, right? It's it's now a string of um, what do I have? Uh, 15 atoms separated by 16 barriers. So you can think of this as a particle in a box, right? So this is your particle in a box. This is your box going from left to right, but it consists of uh, 15 atoms. But in a particle in a box, what kind of wave functions do you expect to see? Well, you expect the ground state to be sort of S-like. So there's a lobe like this. And then you expect your excited state to be uh, the next one to have, be double low. But notice how you have these little wiggles for each of the quantum wells that are in the structure. If you now go to the uh, third state, um, this is the fourth one. So the third state should have three lobes. So we see three and then four. And we had um, 15 barriers, so we should see 15 states. And we can ramp up through the state. So here there's four, five, 
six, seven, and that's in the middle of the band. And then as we go up to eight, uh, we should spell nine, 10, 11, 12, 13. Now you see the anti-bonding three lobed, double bond, uh, double lobed, and here's the ground state. So now we are at the, the top of the band, and again, we're seeing the anti-bonding state that has a, um, a wave function that is for this particle in the box, uh, basically like an S-like state, and that corresponds to here, the topmost state is looking similar to the bottommost state, um, they're just the bonding and anti-bonding version of it. And then the second one down is like the second one up from from up. So so really you're building your particle in a box here and you, you see the block states really emerging naturally. Because I remember as a student, I had a hard time wrapping my head around this, um, the block state. I can do the math, but I didn't really understand what that might mean physically. And here I can visually see it now. Um, the next band up consists always of double lobes inside a well, but then it really is similar. The ground state is going to be uh, like a, a one arch S orbital. The upper, uppermost one should be an arch uh, S orbital, but they're modulated by double block wave functions. So if that's true, we should be able to see that. So here I was at the top of the band. If I go now to the the first state in the um, excited band, so I see my my S-like envelope, and I see the block functions that are now doublets inside each quantum well, and um, they uh, they go uh, low in the barriers, but then we have double, triple, quadruple, five, and then it gets kind of messy in the middle of the band because of the block waves, and as we go up, we have again five four, three, two, and one. and But now we have the anti-bonding uh, state of the, um, of the lower band. So to me, this is a, a much more natural way of, of explaining block waves, what they do physically, and uh, basically explaining a par uh, particle in a box. So with that, we're sort of halfway through the presentation. Um, I can demo more, but maybe it's more instructive if you ask me questions of what you'd like to see. And um, I'll be very happy to, to, to show you some uh, examples or answer any questions. Yeah, we did have one question come in. I think this was on the first tool you were showing. How are yeah. you changing the plot blue to red? Is it by the play mode under the plot? Um, is it about this tool, right? This is the first tool I showed. I believe so, yes. Yeah, so blue to red. Oh, um, I'm not sure. So here, um, this is a composite image with the uh, dispersion and the wave function and sort of a spatial plot of the, um, of the potential profile. So if I click on so if I wanted to look at, for example, the difference between the symmetry of the wave function of the bottom of this band and the top of this band, and from the previous result, that should be the bonding and anti-bonding version. So you can see how the blue is now forming into an anti-bonding. I can't put that on the same on the same plot. Is that the question? Then you can click on other items here on the left, reduced dispersion. So that's just the dispersion by itself. Um, we can superpose um, an effective mass on here, so you can see uh, a parabolic effective mass that lay is laid on top here. And you can kind of tell that the lower bands, the red and the blue, are really overlapping strongly. But for the upper bands, you can clearly see also how these bands turn non-parabolic um, uh, really fast in the case space, and especially if you're in excited states uh, up here, which where the typical uh, conduction bands would be. I mean, these would be uh, the the truly core bound uh, bands that where electrons really don't conduct, and these would be the conduction bands. Is that addressing the question, or am I not quite getting that? 
Um, there was a bit of follow up that said it was when you were showing the comparison. Ah, okay. Yes. Yeah, so the comparison. Um, let let me uh, run this again. Let me go into settings here. This and then they also said there was a shift in amplitude. Oh yeah, yeah. The, the... So. Yeah, so here is the, uh, this is six nanometer or six angstroms and six angstroms. So if you make this barrier thinner, but leave the unit cell the same, you're making the quantum well uh, much wider so that the energy should drop down. So if I compare that, Right, so for the wider wells that are now in gray, in gray uh, you indeed see the bands dropping because the well is much more narrow and the, the green one drops down to this gray one. Uh, if you strictly want to compare the effect of barriers, you also would need to modify, make sure that you keep the well to be the same. Um, this is sort of messy, but you can kind of see here that the bands are coming down and you can also see that the bands are becoming uh, um, having lighter masses. The band width is getting larger. So, and that is kind of what you're expecting because the the coupling between these atoms is sort of uh, is is getting easier. Um, that's only partially true because they also drop down so much. So the better comparison would be doing it like this. Let me go in. And look at the older tool because I, I can get results slightly faster. So let me go in this periodic potential lab. That's the, the older version that runs inside Abacus like this in the in the older uh, infrastructure. So I'm getting the same result here. Um, I'm getting the same. Here's my dispersion. Now, if I really want to compare the same well width, what I have to make sure is if I make this barrier thinner, I also have to make the total well width thinner. So if I what I did earlier is I went to three three angstroms for the, the barrier, but I also then need to make this uh, smaller. If I make this smaller, then nominally my um, my well stayed the same length. The well uh, stayed at six uh, angstrom, and the total set, the total here is nine. And this one I hadn't run, so it's actually running this uh, right now um, uh, in the cloud, and it, it's assembling the the data. And let me look at. Here's the reduced dispersion. It's a little bit bigger. And I can compare these two and there, the, there's not much of an energy shift up and down. And now you can clearly see, while there's not much of an energy shift up and down, since the well is the same, but you can clearly see for, um, for the three angstrom barrier versus the six angstrom barrier, you can see how the bands are getting wider. Let's see, like the blue is the thin barrier, the band, the equivalent band is getting much wider. And here it's actually dipping down. Uh, um, uh, it's, it's rising up. And again, the band is getting much, much wider. Uh, why is it rising up? Because the bonding and anti-bonding coupling between these wells is stronger. So there's actually somewhat of a repulsion now here between these two bands. So um, I hope that addresses the question. Yeah, I think so. They said thank you. And then we have another question. Is it possible in Abacus to show the time evolution of the real and imaginary part of the computed wave function? For example, the whole solution of the Schrodinger equation. Um, I mean, this is all time independent, right? Um, 
there is no no time evolution in this in this calculation it's the this time independent schrodinger equation that's being solved um we are so, but we are not really showing uh the real and the imaginary part of the wave function what we're doing is really just the um the plots of the the bands like this right so here um similarly so let me go back so here's the quantum well with a six and six and here is the uh, quantum well with a three and six uh and we're just showing the um the magnitude square of the wave functions we're not uh, showing more um if it's truly well it, it it will have complex components but there's no time signal here it's steady state a right? time independent Schrodinger solution all right our next question is there a possibility to study the effects of perpendicular magnetic fields on the super lattice energy spectrum um, i.e lando levels lando levels yes um not in the tool set that i have here um that is certainly something one could build and i'd be happy to work with you one of you if you're interested in that that can be reasonably easily included in in the hamiltonians that we that we calculate for the finite super lattice but that is not something that's really there and it's not something i've been teaching um it might be a tool and just to follow up to that um this person said or at least for a double qw hold on so there's some lectures here from physics um but i don't see a tool i don't i don't i don't recall that we i've seen a tool go by um, certainly, I don't have a to built a tool uh, that looks at Lando levels. Um, so not even for a um, for a, uh, a two two particle system or a two well system. But in principle, that can be easily built if you have a MATLAB script that calculates that to create an interface like this is can be done with undergrad students. But I I don't have that. All right. Uh, someone has said, I would like to see how to get the band structure of a direct versus indirect semiconductor. Ah, yeah. So that, so the, the models that I had shown here are the chronic penny model and the sort of the transmission based model. Uh, we do have um, band structure lab, which actually uses tight binding. Uh, to calculate uh, true band structure of materials. So it's launching right now uh, in here. It'll take uh, a couple of seconds. So what this uh, tool allows you to look at is um, a bulk band structure, a nanowire band structure, and an ultra-thin body, so a thin layer band structure for um, electrons um, and phonons and you can do a couple of different materials so if you are for example let's start with a the typical direct gap material electrons gas uh, gallium arsenide um, we're going to look with spin orbit coupling we're going to leave strain alone for now uh, you can choose uh, different symmetry points uh, along to which to plot uh, usually i just go to hit simulate and what it will do, it'll uh, give you, uh, for this 20-band model, the EK diagram. And uh, unfortunately, one of my students took out the, um, the plot for the central band. So you have to zoom in and identify where the central bands are. And the valence band is um, here pegged to zero, so you can... I'll go in here and change the uh, energy range from, say, minus, minus 3 to, say, 4. 
So here is your central band structure of gallium arsenide. So here is uh, uh, your conduction band uh, at gamma. Uh, it goes over here to X and here it goes over to L. You can read off some uh, parameters here. Here is the, uh, the valence bands uh, here, heavy hole, light hole, split off band. Uh, I believe some effective masses are being extracted uh, in this tool. So here are the gaps and the associated effective masses for this uh, material. And you can do things like, uh, as I mentioned, apply some strain, hydrostatic strain, etc., cetera, uh, uniaxial strain to see what happens as you bring atoms closer, what happens to the gap, etc. So you can um, develop some intuition with your students on what happens under compressive strain, for example. Um, if I go back to here and I can now run uh, silicon, I just hit um, simulate. It should uh, also pull out this result uh, from a cache run because I'm sure that has been run before. Um, and again, uh, here is the overall band structure and tight binding. So now I'm plotting the same energy range between minus three and four. So here are the valence bands that look um, slightly more heavy. Here is now silicon with a minimum point roughly at 75%, uh, 80% of the Brion zone on the delta line. Uh, and here's the L point way up. And um, you can look at effective masses of this material as well. Um, so you have um, um, the uh, the masses at the X points at point 0.9 and point uh, 0.2. So those are actually very close to the experimental data. And this parameter set in tight binding is uh, what I've been using extensively in my research to model transistors. So yes, you can do this. Uh, you can look at direct uh, gap and indirect gap materials, and you can also then look at uh, effects of strain uh, in bulk. Uh, when I'm teaching my uh, uh, device class, uh, right now I sent them literally off. Their project is due on Monday. Um, I have them also look at um, band structure of nanowires. I actually have them design a transistor in nanowires. Um, so you can um, here look at things like uh, band structure of a 2.1 nanometer nanowire. And there you have all kinds of interesting band folding. And I teach them that effective mass is actually some a design parameter at the nanometer scale. It's no longer just an input parameter. So here, um, for the nanowire simulations, it actually uh, reruns things. It doesn't pull it out of a, a cache. Um, it's uh, something we have to fix. So it, it runs for a minute or two. But this is still a, a pretty rapid calculation. This tool actually runs NEMO 5 under the hood, um, which is um, actually now also being used to design transistors at Intel. So it's a, it's a pretty sophisticated tool that otherwise you would never run because just installing that thing is, a, is a somewhat of a nightmare. Um, so now uh, it should be plotting this in a couple of seconds. And I'll show you the band structure. Meanwhile, maybe I can take another question as this is thinking about plotting. Yeah, sure. The next question, is it possible to import a customary code inside Abacus to use its interface, like loading a Python script? Abacus is not really meant for that. Uh, what, if you want to run Python scripts, uh, you can certainly do that in Nanohub. Nanohub. Tools, Jupyter. So there's a full-fledged Jupyter engine here um, that has a variety of plotting and, and um, otherwise tools. You can even launch tools that are installed in NanoHub, such as Nemo 5 or Padre. Uh, in fact, so it's launching Jupyter right now. So this is my disk space uh, in which I uh, work myself. So here's a um, where's my class stuff? So here's something that um, 
I'm doing resume voting, for example, in my professional development class. So I evaluate my own data here in this Jupyter uh, notebook like this. And I read in data. So that's a full-fledged um, Jupyter notebook, and, and I'm plotting and analyzing data. So you can certainly do that. And by the way, this tool here is actually an app version of a Jupyter notebook. And it, it calls the underlying Rapture tool. It's just it's a nicer, newer interface uh, to an old tool. So so the infrastructure is all there to to install tools and then call them from a variety of interfaces or script them with a Jupyter notebook or a Python script. Um, the tool here that I had shown this tool here that I had demoed. This one is actually running a an early version of Nemo 5, a prototype in, in MATLAB. So you can run all kinds of tools inside in in the engine and uh, and uh, have an interface that is common. You don't have to do it in Abacus. Abacus by itself is just a list of tools, and all of these tools are individually available on NanoHub. I just assembled them into one package, so to speak. Does that answer the question? Ah, so here the plotting did happen. Only and let me zoom in here. So here is the band structure for a silicon nanowire that's 2.1 nanometer um, in diameter. And it's looking at whatever the eight lowest bands, and you see all kinds of band folding. You see the so-called valley splitting here. Um, you can see that this mass is quite different than this mass, and it's not at the X point. And I have them tune tune the masses as a function of strain, etc. So. So that's what I do in, in my class uh, for the advanced students to design nanowires. Oh, I see indium antimonide band structure would be useful. And I see, is it possible to compute electronic state of quantum dots? Uh, yeah, I can, let me, maybe I take over this. I, I just see a bunch of questions now. So we have a tool called quantum dot lab, which also runs Nemo 5 under the hood. And um, so here's uh, uh, quantum.lab. And I, you can use it in two ways. Um, so for simple uh, things like uh, teaching particle, particle in a box, etc., you can do simple cuboids. Uh, you can also do pyramids. And simple, simply in effective mass, you can um, calculate some eigenstates here. You can shine light with different polarizations onto the system. Uh, there's some advanced options, but in general, for the simple stuff, you just hit simulate. And uh, uh, here you see a 3D rendering of a uh, the ground state uh, wave function. Here's a, a, a the excited state, so the P-like state. The other one should be rotated around, so that's the third one. Uh, the fourth one is interesting as it has a, a a peak in the apex, but also a double a node that is now being split. So it's the symmetry is taking over. You can uh, look at um, the absorption in in such a system. Uh, you can see the absorption as a function of a certain sweep angle. So here it's sweeping against theta. And the real cool thing I think that I have my students do is is look at um, looking at different uh, dimensions and how states look how states move and look how um, um, absorption peaks move and I actually have them work on a project early on in my course where they design an optical detector for specific wavelengths. So here the wave functions themselves don't look a whole lot different. Um, but the absorption spectrum does look quite a bit different. So here is the the taller dot. Here's the narrow dot. You can compare them um, and look look at them. And uh, if you 
want to do something more complex, you can look at a multi-layered quantum dot uh, where you really have wetting layers, capping layers, etc. You can use different band structure models. Um, you can calculate strain in the system with a valence force field. Um, uh, these calculations take a longer time. Um, so uh, you can set certain outputs and the output options you can also, this will now go to a, a parallel machine. If I had simulate, it actually uh, will query the availability of a remote machine, pick the best queue, and it'll come back uh, with results unless there is, for example, a cached result already available. So right now you um, see it checks on the on the cube and all these simulations then take some anywhere between 10 minutes to two hours or so it depends on how large you make the system and how complex you make the system um but this is all available in it, what we call quantum dot lab uh, a related question coming in the quantum dot simulation does the quantum dot simulation also provide direction and polarization dependence of absorption? Yeah, that's exactly what I'm doing with my um, um, in my class. So now this thing is running. I'm going to keep it running. I'm going to start a new instance. So, in fact, Unless this question is from one of my students that joined, so actually they did the project already. I'm just teasing. So let me. Here's the tool. Um, so what I, for example, do in in the class, um, let's take a. They, they, I let them figure out that polarization is uh, directional dependent. So let me make a a cuboid that is. Um, uh, wide in one dimension, narrow in the other, and, and pretty flat in the other. Um, and what I'm doing here is I'm actually sweeping the, um, the phi angle, and I'm setting theta to 90. So so I'm, I'm, I'm looking at different um, Polarization, so let me do, leave that at 45. And I need to change this image here. Um, so now I run this, and you should see in X and Y uh, different polarizations because the energy spectrum is uh, the uh, split in, in the X and Y direction. And you will see different polarizations in different uh, directions, even in the simple effective mass model. If you use the, certainly the full tight binding, you actually get also the um, uh, the polarization dependence in in the underlying crystal symmetry. So here's my my dot that's relatively flat, two nodes, second one. Third one, you can also see the uh, eigenenergies that are calculated. So here's the ground state. This is the first excited state. It's quite a bit split uh, between um, these, and this is where you see different absorption. Um, see here you have uh, different peaks emerging as a function of uh, sweep angle. So, so this peak really emerges um, uh, if you're if your angle phi is at 90, and this one uh, emerges when the angle of phi is zero. So, so yes, you can get the polarization dependent out. Um, I just see one more question. Is it possible to introduce Rashbaugh Dresselhaus spin orbit effects? So, certainly the spin orbit is, is included. Uh, in in the tight binding that we use, and also the rush by effects are included if you want to uh, have magnetic fields, etc. Um, so for the research side, we do that. Uh, I as I said, we, I don't recall seeing a tool that really uh, uh, messes around with uh, magnetic fields too much, uh, but certainly 
even um, I mean, if you have a heterostructure uh, like a double well, and you solve it in tight binding or a quantum dot, um, the typical Dresselhaus and Rashba effects are coming out for free because um, you don't have to stick them in as a parameterization like with k.p. They naturally emerge by the breaking of the crystal symmetry um, um, and you, it's not a fitting parameter. So if you have spin orbit coupling in your system, it's naturally there. It's part of your basis. It's not a retrofitting after the fact. All right, and then just a last comment. Maybe you already saw this one. Someone said band structure of INSB would be useful. Yeah, in indium and Um Yeah, in principle, that can be added. Um, not hard at all. We have it in our database. So, Amy, could you um, take that down as a note? So I'm going to... Uh, I'm going to modify this code slightly so to have that list in there with indium and timonide and mm -hmm. also plot uh, the central bands again. Mm -hmm. So if that's it, we're close to the top of the hour. I'd say thank you very much and hopefully I see you next week. Thank you.